Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to our fireside chat. Uh, I am joined by Rachel Armstrong from One Manchester. Welcome, Rachel, and Rosanna Bull from the Happiness Index. So we're going to be spending the next 30 minutes or so um, just talking about how um, the Happiness Index and One Manchester came to start working together in our partnership, but more so listening around sort of the story and the evolution of how will Manchester have listened to their employees? But before we get into that, Rachel, so tell us a bit about yourself. So how did you end up in HR? Where did your career, uh, where's your career taking you? And how did you come to be in this, this current role? Oh, wow. So how long have you got, <laughs> Mark? <laughs> um, I actually have gone full circle um, when it comes to, I suppose, getting into HR in that um, after I completed my master's degree in organisational psychology, I started as an an intern industrial psychologist or an organizational psychologist in the human resources department. And that was in a leading financial services institution in South Africa. Um, So I was very, very blessed at the time. It gave me an opportunity to work on a wide range of projects um, across the entire HR division. Um, And then from there, I was actually offered a permanent appointment, but not in in human resources, actually. I was asked to start up a marketing and communications department. Um, So off I went (laughs) and and did that and had lots of fun, you know, sort of learning the ropes there. Um, And then a few years later, I was actually um, asked to manage the operational service of our very own staff retirement fund. Um, And then that subsequently led to managing other retirement funds and the commercial side of the business um and then eventually promoted to head of a service where i was asked to get involved obviously with the op- not only the operational side but uh, supports and lead on customer and people strategic improvement projects which was loads and loads of fun um <laughs> then from there <laughs> um i was asked to um head up the learning and development uh, internal communications and management reporting function for our division which I then did. And it was kind of as I suppose uh, the the change piece of work that I was doing was sort of coming to, I suppose, a a close or before we started on the next journey that I decided to relocate back to the UK. Um, And obviously with learning and development kind of being an engagement being my I suppose my passion, um, I thought I'd, I'd, you know, come back to the UK and look look for some work in that line. So I've ended up at One Manchester um, and I'm the learning and development business partner there at the moment. Okay. And and tell us about One Manchester then. Tell us about what they what they do, what type of people you employ, and and tell us, you know, broadly speaking around, you know, how you're more than just a landlord. Oh, (laughs) yeah. So we're a provider of housing and community services. Uh, We're a non-profit organisation. We employ approximately 400 colleagues. And uh, you'll see that these are a mixture of uh, both trades and office space workers. Um, So we currently own and manage more than 12,000 homes in central, south and east Manchester. Um, We are an experienced and trustworthy landlord. Uh, We do provide good quality homes that are safe, secure, warm and affordable. But we believe, as Mark has rightly said, that our responsibilities go so much further than just providing houses. Um, So we are more than just a landlord. And, you know, we transform communities, we provide opportunities and, and we try to change people's lives. And we regularly look at all the issues that go beyond housing and especially things that are specific to our communities. Um, So we'll help, for example, people manage their money, we'll help them find work, um, start up businesses, and just generally stay healthy and well. Um, We've invested in lots and lots of charities, we've helped raise hundreds and thousands of pounds in grants and commissions, um, and we really just try, you know, to look for those smart collaborations with our partners to really understand and address local issues. And then I suppose, you know, we don't always go out there to to look for awards, but we have won uh, several awards for our work. Um, And it's really lovely to be able to receive that recognition. Uh, We've retained the highest regulatory rating for governance and viability. And we've achieved a gold award for investors in people and also the investors in people health and well-being award. That's great. I mean, you're you're making such a big difference to your communities, aren't you? So, I mean, your people are going to make a big difference to that. So I will hand over to Rosanna to talk through the the One Manchester story. 
So as your customer success manager, I've absolutely loved working with One Manchester for the last six months or so. Um, I found the journey so far already super exciting. Um, it'd be great if you could set the scene for us a little bit more in terms of what your main people priorities have been um, and sort of how you've addressed those, Rachel. Yes, um, of course. Um, so I think it, probably a good starting point is to mention that one of our key strategic objectives is what we've called, you know, healthy organisation. And among other things, uh, this means that we want to continue to make One Manchester a happy and healthy place to work for our colleagues. Um, so for us, you know, it's really important to grow and improve our organisational culture. And it's mm -hmm. something that we hold really close to our hearts. Um, I think, you know, one of our main priorities, you know, since the start of the pandemic has really just to remain connected and to listen to our colleagues in the present. And then we've also taken a bold step where we've wanted to work and consult with those colleagues even further in terms of what the future would look like. Um, so I think that's, you know, the, the people are at the heart of, of everything we do, you know, whether that's our own people or whether that's you know, translated into our tenants, um, we really do care about about them. Definitely. And how else would you say that COVID-19 has sort of affected those priorities? Um, also, of course, affected One Manchester as a business? So um, I think, you know, and I, and I always try to look at, at the positive side of, of things, but I definitely think that our organisation has embraced this new world with enthusiasm and positivity. So the challenges that have been thrown at us as an organization, we've, we've embraced those, we've worked hard to find new ways of working. So I think it's definitely made us more agile and mm -hmm. it's made us look at more ways, you know, to become more efficient. Um, you know, I think it's also made us more innovative. Um, so we've obviously had to really look hard in terms of how we would provide business continuity or service continuity during these challenging times. Um, you know, obviously we moved a lot of core services into the digital space. Mm -hmm. As you're probably all aware, you know, all of us had to have crash courses on Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Google Meet, whatever the case has been, just to try and keep, keep that connectivity alive. Mm -hmm. um, moved our lettings processes to digital, you know, we've used technology to connect families and groups in the community, uh, you know, looked at, you know, new ways to deliver training, um, looked at digital engagement platforms and services for our colleagues. So it's definitely made us more innovative. Um, I think what the pan pandemic's also done for us is highlighted how much we care about each other. You know, yeah. I think that has definitely come through. Absolutely, how much we care about each other, how much we care about our communities and uh, obviously our customers at the end of the day. And then I think finally what it's what how it's impacted us is that it's also created uh, opportunities for us. Mm -hmm. So it created opportunities for us to go above and beyond, you know, to improve the services that we provide to our customers. I think it's provided us opportunities for growth. Um, I think it's brought to the front, you know, existing inequalities in our communities, and it's given us the opportunity to build back better and fairer and work really closely with our health, uh, health providers and other partners so that we can continue to create happy and healthy homes for people and try and keep those places or those communities as inclusive as possible. Absolutely. How how would you say that your values and the culture at One Manchester has helped to inform this response then? Well, I think one thing that stood out for us, you know, during the course of last year is that we definitely have a culture of care, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that the emotional connection that our colleagues have had with each other, you know, with our customers and our communities has definitely resonated throughout the organization um, and it's driven our colleagues you know not only to achieving you know our big business goals but actually exceeding them you know and going above and beyond in order to make sure that one manchester still you know provides a great service to its mm -hmm. tenants and you know if you consider that 2020 was probably the hardest year ever you know for most of our colleagues um, you know they've had to adjust to working from home 
um, homeschooling, you know, possibly caring for sick loved ones, or just those that have been on the front line, you know, if if we look back and we we see all of our achievements, um, you know, I mean, our colleagues went above and beyond, you know, to adapt, to adjust, and to support people. And I definitely think that that couldn't have been achieved without that emotional connectivity and that culture of care. Mm-hmm. Um, so I suppose just to give you a, a few examples, you know, we we continued throughout the pandemic to provide in employment support for people you know our technicians facilities and caretaking teams they've donned their ppe they went into our tenants homes mm-hmm. you know ensured that there was a seamless service that was provided obviously when we were able to do that because at first we weren't allowed to provide all our services only emergencies mm-hmm. um, you know and and to my mind you know they were just our superheroes you know they really did just stand out they did what they had to do and and they kept the one Manchester flame alive. Um, We had people in our organisation that gave up their day jobs um, and worked across teams and contacted 8,571 vulnerable customers, uh, supported them with provisions, delivered food parcels, gave financial advice, helped generate hundreds and thousands of pounds in benefit gains, you know, we obviously gave, you know, mental health and social uh, social isolation support, um, you know, so I think, you know, just those three examples demonstrate that, you know, that there's a culture there of care and that, and that our values have, have definitely helped us, you know, to support our response during the pandemic. Absolutely. And we've all faced so many new challenges this year. So it's great to hear that One Manchester has sort of met those expectations and encouraged that culture really well. Um, Of course, you've been partnered with us for just over six months now. How is it you've been listening to your people during this time and sort of understanding how they've been feeling? Um, so what we tried to do was open up um, multiple opportunities for them to have their say about matters that affected their interests at work mm-hmm. and obviously the interests of the organisation. Um, you know, we thought that we had, you know, and we do have a fantastic service benefit offer in place already, um, but we, we obviously wanted to, you know, engage with, with people more, find out what they were going through. Um, and to see whether there was any other support that we could give our colleagues. I mean, obviously, we were giving a lot of support, the colleagues were giving a lot of support to their communities, mm-hmm. but we wanted to make sure we were there for our people too. So I think that having the multiple channels sort of enabled us to get the comprehensive story that we wanted in terms of how our colleagues were feeling throughout mm-hmm. the course of the year. So probably just give you a little bit of a a pick and mix of a few of the things that we've embarked on and try to get a, a good understanding there. Um, you know, obviously over and above sort of the online team meetings that everybody has, you know, some areas are having daily scrums where they get together and they connect for 15 minutes every day. Uh, it's just a quick check-in to see how everybody's doing. Our chief executive um, held drop-in sessions uh, mm-hmm. coordinated with Nick's because her name's Nicole, where <laughs> You know, that was open to everybody. You know, she opened her virtual door. Anybody could pop in, ask any questions, get any updates. And it was an anything goes kind of meeting. Um, Obviously, we've had, you know, the social committee organize events after hours just to try and keep people connected and engaged. We've sent out weekly email updates. Uh, You know, well, our EMT has done that. Um, we've, We've sort of added the personal touch in, in the form of welfare calls and manager check-in sessions. And we've even had some, you know, EMT sessions or executive management team meeting with, you know, our frontline workers or areas where, you know, that they, they might be struggling or maybe not as connected um, just mm-hmm. to try and help them there. Um, so we've had all of these, this, this personal touch uh, approach to listening, but what we've also found extremely useful um, was the colleague voice platform um, that which was the, the digital engagement, the online tool um, that we've used, you know, and it really helped us to identify immediately and quickly, you know, what our colleagues were going through. So it was kind of the good, the bad and the ugly. So there was lots of positive sentiments about homeworking and, you know, ha- grateful for, for, you know, the health and safety of their family. Mm-hmm. But on the 
side, you'd have, you know, people saying, well, that they're feeling really nervous. The pandemic is, you know, creating a bit of anxiety for them. Um, you know, people maybe weren't feeling safe in their roles. Um, so it was really useful for us to get the story of, of how our colleagues were feeling, you know, throughout the year. And it was interesting to see how, how that changed. So mm -hmm. the concerns that were being raised in March versus the concerns that were being raised in June and then again in November, how it all shifted and changed. And we didn't just listen, you know, so we took everything on board. We took all the feedback we got from the platform, you know, from the welfare calls, from, you know, all the different interactions. And we worked together behind the scenes, we being obviously myself, the leadership team, even our chief executive, executive teams, we worked together behind the scenes to either, you know, go off and do some more deep diving or mm -hmm. to look at how we were going to support people, where there were concerns raised. Um, and I think, you know, that that's that's the example of the active listening. And I think that's the example of where actively listening does pay off because, you know, I, I believe that some of the interventions that we did contributed to people no longer feeling that they needed to raise things as issues on the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You know, at, at one of many, I mean, it could have also been that they were, um, you know, getting used to the change or they were settling into the new ways of working. Um, but we've definitely had feedback, you know, to say, that people felt that if they raised anything on the Colleague Voice platform, um, that they trusted that it would be addressed or acknowledged and responded to. Um, so, so we kind of did that and then, and that was obviously working with people in the here and now. Yeah. What we also decided to do was, was quite boldly embark on what we called the Shaping Our Future survey, which was kind of the view, the view for the future, you know, so to ask our colleagues you know, how, how they would like one Manchester to look and feel in the future, you know, understanding what their challenges were now, uh, where we could do improvements. And that once again has been, you know, it's been phenomenal. We've received, you know, an 84% response rate. We've received almost 4,000 comments. And that's enabled us to actually, you know, drive and inform our culture change uh, and our on our broader business change program. Um, which has been absolutely fantastic. So we're actually turning these insights that we're receiving into actions. Some of them we've dealt with immediately and others we, we're taking a longer term view. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I think we've be, we've really listened. And, and what's been great is that people have wanted to engage. I mean, I remember at the start of our journey together, you know, we kind of said, well, let's give it a go. Let's see, you know, we're not sure our colleagues would possibly want to engage in this tool and we've absolutely been overwhelmed people have wanted to engage more than ever before haven't they you know and and that's clearly come out yeah so it's really good for us yeah it's, it's such a good sign that people want to have their voice heard and feel like there's someone listening I think that's so essential um you spoke you spoke a bit about the leadership team obviously initiatives like Natters with Nick, which I think is absolutely fantastic, having that sort of unprecedented access to the CEO of a company. How else have your board and leadership team supported you in this journey, Rachel? Well, um, I've been very, very lucky in that regard, um, in that um, the feedback that we receive from, from the Colleague Voice, from the Shaping Our Future survey, you know, from any initiatives that we've done, are fed back to the leadership management team, to the executive team, and to the board as well. Um, so we have a lot of support from all those levels, um, and they've really recognised our efforts. And naturally, you know, with us feeding into the business change program, um, that then obviously would then go to board, and we we were asking now for budget, you know, for our people strategy and and to implement some projects that we'd like to do to improve and shape the future. Um, so we're definitely getting their support when it comes to that. Um, I think our leaders have definitely been, you know, accountable. They've been approachable. Mm -hmm. They've been really supportive and, and empathetic throughout the process. And I, and I admire them and, and thank them, you know, for, for the fact that they've always responded with agility, you know. And I think mm -hmm. having, you know, the leadership visibility and the support has definitely been one of our secret ingredients, you know, that's made this this process successful you know they they don't just pay lip service 
you know, to holding engagement close to their hearts or caring about their colleagues. You know, their actions have definitely held their weight in gold. Um, so, yes, it's just been absolutely exemplary. You know, you can ask them to support you with anything. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, encouraging colleagues to engage and participate in an initiative, you know, celebrating the good, formulating action plans, you know, to respond to concerns. It's really just been all hands on deck. No questions asked. Nobody ever says, you know, why are we doing this? Or, you know, I don't think we should respond to this. Or, you know, I'm a little bit tied up this week. You know, can we sort this out in like a month's time when my diary's free? You know, we don't get anything like that. You know, everybody just yeah. drops everything. They pull together. They work together. And, and they really do support us. And I think, again, you know, without that emotional connection to our colleagues, you know, we wouldn't have been able to achieve that. So we've been really and truly blessed that we definitely do have the right leaders with the right, I suppose, priorities or they, their hearts are in the right place. You know, they really do care. Definitely. It's so, so positive to have that support and backing from leadership. So you're not sort of isolated, the only one passionate about this journey. In terms of the future, what sort of journey do you want to take your people on sort of throughout this year 2021 and beyond well I think you know we've even though we started off again with, with some challenges obviously some mm -hmm. of our services have been cut back you know um, as, a, as a consequence of the new lockdown uh, what we've tried to do is um, find a, a role or find a job or find work for everybody so if people were working in tenanted properties previously, we've moved them to void properties or empty properties so that they can work there. You know, we, we've asked people to support with the vulnerable um, customer project. So what we've really tried to do is keep everybody, you know, involved, connected, contributing to the organization, which I think has been fantastic. Um, obviously, we're going to carry on building from some of the fantastic work we've done in 2020. Mm -hmm. So we're going to Know, carry on with the work we've been doing in our communities we're going to carry on really getting to know our customers better really try to you know give them the best service possible we're going to continue to provide you know employment and skills support opportunities build the you know the healthy affordable homes leverage off technology to improve our services and really just continue, you know, big emphasis on supporting our colleagues' well-being right now. So that's kind of where we are in the here and the now. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, we, we're going to move to designing and delivering on our Shaping Our Future Business Change program. So that's going to translate into some really exciting projects for our people, you know, to, to help us, uh, you know, support our people strategy, to improve our customer experience, you know, to look at how we can improve on, on digital delivery and obviously our business insights capability as well. So, you know, this program has been shaped by a lot of consultation with our colleagues and our customers. So we're really looking forward to turning all those insights into actions mm -hmm. and realizing the benefits. And we're going to take our colleagues with us on the journey. So, um, you know, yeah, the whole way. Yeah. Such a, <laughs> such a great story. Um, if you, uh, and I'm going to go a bit more theoretical now, if you could get in your magic machine and go back a year <laughs> and you could give yourself some words of wisdom, what would you say to yourself? You know, I, want, I want both a work and a social one. Oh, I thought mine would go, yeah, oh gosh. Well, you know, when I think about myself personally, you know, I mean, I think I can confidently say that I've been through a lot of change in my life you know you've probably saw up front I've had a very varied career where I've had to sort of assume different roles every three to five years you know I've obviously lived in two countries you know I've emigrated twice we've all had kids and we know what challenges of change that can bring for all of us um you know and I think like everybody you know I've, I've ridden the roller coaster of life you know we've all had the good times we've all worked through some difficult and challenging times you know we've we've gone through those twists and turns um, and I've always seen myself as being quite resilient as a result of that you know and pretty much agile and flexible and go with the flow be prepared for anything but you know I think looking back at you know January 2020 I don't really think I appreciated the full extent speed and duration 
um, of the changes we were all going to experience, you know, both professionally and personally. Um, I wasn't prepared this time, you know, so, you know, who would have thought that, you know, food supplies and toilet rolls would be under question, you know, <laughs> and that my children were not going to be going to school anymore. So it was all kind of, you know, a bit, a bit odd. And I just think, you know, for me, the the words of wisdom, or, or maybe it would be a reminder, because I think we often tell tell each other this, but we sometimes forget is just remember, you know, cherish the good times, you know, spend time with people that you love, live every day as if it's your last, you know, don't major in the minors, you know, don't sweat the small stuff, and never, ever, ever take things for granted. Because um, I think that, you know, as we've gone through this journey that we've all been on, um, I think we've probably all realised that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Which so leads us, that leads us quite nicely to our final question for you, which is a very important one, which we hold dear to our hearts. So outside of your career, what makes you happy? Oh, I've got loads. But um, <laughs> but I suppose some of the highlights is uh, I really love uh, making and remembering memories with my family and friends through crafting. So I actually do scrapbooking. Um, so... Um, so yeah, so that's a, a huge passion of mine. I've been doing that since my eldest daughter was five and she's now 17. So got loads of different albums there, be those travel, you know, the kids, school. Um, so that really makes me happy if I get an opportunity to sort of keep those memories. Um, you know, I'm a bit of a tourist here as well. Um, so I try and get out and about as much as possible try and visit and, you know, explore a variety of places or as much as I can do with all the limitations that have been going on. Um, so that makes me happy if I'm able to get out and explore and experience new things. Um, and obviously what makes me happy is if I'm able to juggle the interests of three children and a husband when I, you know, decide on that outing. If I can get all five of us to go along, that that's definitely a, a positive. Um, and then I think finally, you know, I'm really, really happy when we bry. Uh, which is what South African <laughs> call a barbecue. So, yes, we get opportunities to get out there and have our braai um, when the weather's nice. That that also really makes me happy. Well, I think we're all looking forward to braaiing sometime <laughs> soon. Um, well, thanks a lot, Rachel. We appreciate that. And uh, thanks, Rosanna. And, uh, yeah, we hope to see you all soon. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rosanna.